Part 1. You will hear a man called Ken talking on the phone to a friend called Liz about holiday accommodation. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello? Hi Liz, it's Ken here. Hi Ken, nice to hear from you. Are you... This is just a quick call. But Mary and I have just been talking about our summer holiday. We haven't booked a place yet, and we've left it a bit late. We were just wondering if you know of any holiday rentals in your area. It's so nice there. Well, yes. I can think of two or three places that are very nice. What dates have you got in mind? The 10th of July to the 22nd of July. Oh, yes. That is quite soon, isn't it? Well, there's a place near here called Moonfleet. Is that M O O N F L double E T? That's right. It's quite a rural location, and it's next to the owner's house, but it's got fields all around it, so it's very pretty. Hmm, sounds okay. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Well, it's an annex to the owner's house, and it's an apartment with two bedrooms, and an open-plan living area. Well, I like the sound of it. Is there anything we might not like about it? Well, it's quite a distance from the nearest shops, that's all. OK. And... Well, I'll tell Mary, but I don't think she'd mind that. Do you know how you book it? You have to book on the internet. There's a web address. It's www.summerhouses. One word? Yes. Then dot com. You'll be able to look at a photograph on that. OK. And what about the others? Where are they? The second one I'm thinking of is called Kingfisher, and that's even more rural. It's a really beautiful location, in fact. It's by the river, and it's got nice views. It overlooks woodland on the other side. Is that an apartment? No, it's a three-bedroomed house, and that's got a dining room, as well as a separate living room and a kitchen. But I expect it's more expensive. You'll have to check the prices. Hmm. It's probably a bit bigger than we need. But our nephew might be joining us. We're not sure yet. How do you book Kingfisher? You have to phone the owner directly. Shall I give you the number? I've got it here in my phone book. It's 01752 669 218. Right. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And you mentioned a third place? Yes, there's a house that my sister stayed in last year. It's called Sunnybanks. Nice name. And the location of that one is rather different. It's in the centre of a village, but it's a very small and quaint place. Did your sister like it? Oh, yes. It's by the sea, so her children really loved it. What's the accommodation like? I'm not sure about the number of rooms, because I haven't been in it myself, but I think she said it's quite spacious, and I know it's got its own garden. It's not very big, but it's not shared with anyone else, and it's supposed to be very pretty. Any snags? Problems? The only other thing I can think of is that there's nowhere for parking. The streets are too narrow, so you have to leave your car somewhere else, and then walk to the house. It's only about ten minutes away, but... OK. 
Well, I don't think it matters personally. How do you book it? There's an agent you have to contact. I don't know his details, but I can ask my sister and let you know tomorrow. Thanks, Liz. That'd be great. I'll talk to Mary and see what she says. Thanks for your help. That's okay, Ken. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. I hope you find what you're looking for. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. I'm here today with Helen Warner, who has been a vegetarian for many years and is going to talk a little about vegetarianism. Helen, the concept of vegetarianism seems to have interested a number of our listeners, who have sent in some questions. To begin, what made you want to become a vegetarian? Well, when I was 16, I had friends who were vegetarian and they introduced me to the idea. My parents were typical of their generation and ate meat at least three or four times a week, so I didn't really think about it too much until a few years later. It was while I was at university that I really thought about it and decided that it was unfair to eat meat when there are so many alternatives available. Is there anything you miss about not eating meat? Um, no, not really. As I said, there are so many substitutes available these days, perhaps the most important of which comes from the soya bean. Soya is so versatile and is the staple substitute for most vegetarians. So what about the nutritional value of vegetarian food? Isn't it true that there are some vitamins that you can't get from soya or vegetables alone? Surely people need these vitamins. Yes, that's correct. But actually there is only one vital vitamin that is only present in meat. That's vitamin B12. Most vegetarians are aware of the implication of this and actually take B12 supplement in the form of tablets. Of course, the way you cook vegetables is also very important in preserving vitamins. Many countries, particularly the UK, have a reputation for overcooking vegetables. Water-soluble vitamins, you know, where the vitamins are dissolved into the water, are often lost. Vitamin C is a common example. However, the loss of vitamins can be avoided by microwaving or steaming vegetables, which is what I do whenever I cook. Some people don't want to change their cooking habits too much, so if you do boil them, simply cut down on the cooking time. So a vegetarian diet is fairly healthy then? Oh yes. A lot of people believe that vegetarianism is unhealthy, but that's actually not the case. Vegetarians are actually considerably healthier than many meat eaters. Consider for a minute the health aspects of the incredible amount of meat this country and others like it consume. The statistics for beef eating, for example, are quite frightening. The world figure for beef consumption is slightly less than 11 kilograms per person each year. Yet in Europe, the average consumption is nearly double that at 21 kilos per person. And in the USA, it is even worse, with the average person eating 44 kilograms of beef every year. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So are you suggesting that people stop eating meat altogether and everyone adopts a vegetarian lifestyle? No, not at all. Even in the healthiest diets, there is still a place for meat, but it should be eaten in moderation. Many nutritionists think of foods in terms of a pyramid, with the foods we can eat relatively freely at the bottom and the foods we should carefully restrict at the top. The majority of our diet should be composed of cereals, which would go on the bottom row of the pyramid. In this category could also be included such things as rice and pasta. Next, a good diet is followed by a roughly equal amount of vegetables and fruit. I have at least two servings a day of fruit and vegetables whenever possible. In decreasing quantities, you can then eat dairy foods, eggs, cheese, etc. Almost at the top of the food pyramid comes fish, carefully prepared of course, not dripping in oil or batter, and white meat. Chicken, for example, is a comparatively healthy meat, but again, a lot of this comes down to preparation methods. Right at the top of the pyramid come the ingredients of far too many Western meals, red meat and potatoes. It is particularly in that area that I would suggest moderation. Well, thank you very much, Helen. I'm sure that a lot of listeners are interested in your views. How could they find out more about the health benefits of vegetarian options? Well, there are lots of websites and books on healthy eating and vegetarianism, but it is always important to remember to consult your doctor before making any radical changes to your diet or lifestyle. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. The next important development in how history is recorded came with print. In the 8th century, the Chinese invented paper and woodblock printing. Remember that up to this time, very few people could read and write, and so only a very small number of people could understand written history. Suddenly, many books appeared, and many more people learnt to read. In the 14th century, the first printing press was invented in Germany. This reduced how long it took to produce books. The new printing technique quickly spread to other parts of the world. More books appeared, and even more people learnt to read. The first printed newspaper appeared in 1605 and the first daily newspaper in 1702. Now, people could read news stories soon after the event happened, and every event was recorded and stored. The problem with newspaper history is that newspaper reporters could tell the stories they wanted to tell, and not necessarily the truth. Photography was the next important development – we generally agree that photography was born in 1839. Some of the earliest photographs that the public saw were images of the American Civil War. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. People were shocked by the photographs of dead soldiers and for the first time saw the reality of war. By 1850, photographs appeared regularly in newspapers and people now expected the truth. At the end of the 19th century came the first motion picture camera. Soon, history was being recorded as moving images. In the 1930s, television brought moving images into people's homes. More and more people saw history as it happened, and more and more history was recorded. Today, of course, we expect that every event in the world is recorded. Satellite TV and the Internet allow people to watch any event, anywhere in the world, as it happens. It doesn't matter if the TV cameras are not there. People carry around mobile phones and can record any incident and then share it online. Families have their own video cameras and record their own history. Children now grow up watching their parents and grandparents on film. I'm sure you'll agree that the transition from storytelling to what we have today has been dramatic, and I hope that... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. Nine. Listen to the second part of our lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. River dance is not just an expression of self-confidence, a kind of culturally interesting pop song. It tells the story of a people through song and dance. It tells the story of the people whose spirit was broken by an event which occurred in the middle of the last century but continued to affect the society until 1961, the Great Famine. What is a famine? In 1840, the official population of Ireland was 8 million. They were largely poor and living in the countryside. They were beginning to have an interest in independence and perhaps had things been different, Ireland might have been independent much earlier. But there was a serious problem in the agricultural system. All crops were grown to pay the rent of the land and all that was grown to eat was the potato. This was fine until the potato crop failed, as it did from 1845 to 1848. The stories of what happened in those times live on in the popular culture of Ireland, and I won't tell them here, but the result was that two million people died or left the country by 1851. When you realise that the population continued to go down until 1961, you can realise what a disastrous effect this famine had on the people. Compared with China, imagine if the famine of 1960 reduced the population by a quarter and it kept falling to less than half of its pre-famine figure. Anybody with ideas left and went to England, America or Australia. The people left behind were broken by their experiences and, in effect, 
The famine and its consequences put an end to all serious development in the country until well into this century. The Irish in Ireland lost all hope and self-confidence, and much of our modern culture is about the sadness of that time and the sorrow of saying goodbye to those who left and left well into this century. Ireland has the highest emigration rate of any country in Europe for the last two centuries. We even have an expression for this saying goodbye. It is called the American Wake. It means the ceremony, like that of a funeral for someone going to America, because you will never see him or her again. Do you know why there is Irish music on the film Titanic? It is because most of the people killed were Irish. The leaving continued until the 1970s because independence in 1921 was followed by a civil war and an economic depression. Almost every family in Ireland has relatives abroad and up to the 60s in some places of a class of 30 graduating from high school all left. Along the west coast, closed up houses from that time falling into ruin are still common. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.